What is up, Generals? We are back with Ultimate General Civil War. We're playing the Union Major General campaign, and this is Fiasco. Uh, finals are over. <laughs> so um, I sat down and I uh, I treated myself to uh, the attack at the Mule Shoe. So I don't know if this really qualifies as a... I mean, it's officially listed as kind of a side battle, but this is a... This is a good size fight. This is two full size core against probably their equivalent number in um uh well they outnumber me a little bit, but Confederate forces. Um in the lead up towards uh Cold Mountain. So um I know that I kind of zoomed past the army prep screen. Um I recorded this entirely without uh audio on the day of and I'm doing it all post uh, post facto. So we've got second and third core going. I'm still trying to get Grant his third star before Cold Harbor. I, I don't think it happens, um, which is fine. It's okay. He'll get it before the end of the campaign. And um, mostly it's because second and third core were the most complete or the most ready to go um, of the core that I have. And um, the methodology for developing the armies or whatever is uh, sort of a continuation of what we've been working on and what my Confederate strategy is turning into is raw recruits until an additional recruit would either do one of the following, take you over the unit cap, which is a self-imposed unit cap right now of 1500. Um, and likely that won't go up. I, I will not likely push higher than 15 before Richmond. Um, and, or an additional unit cap would, uh, unit, an additional unit of recruits would remove a unit of its star. So what that ultimately breaks down to is some of the units that have gotten mauled in previous engagements are tiny. I've got a 760-man unit on this battlefield. Um, but it also means that there's a bunch of 1,500-man units, 1,400-man units. There's plenty of big ones. Um, there's a slight preference towards round numbers, uh, so numbers ending in a zero, basically. Um, but that's just kind of a, a symmetry thing. Um, and that's generally what I got going on. So this is a... Um, this is two core who's leading the attack. These are my, my better troops. This is fiasco, uh, his command. And it occurs to me that second core is turned into something of an elite command. It's, it's a huge native presence of two star units. And it's probably because I, I use them so often in the side battles. Um, and that was unintentional. Uh, although it, it does end up kind of paying dividends here. Um, once second core gets committed to the fight, things fall apart for the Confederates pretty quickly. Um, I've also dropped the Light Division out of Second Corps for the course of this battle, um, predominantly because this battlefield does not really encourage the use of cavalry, uh, especially in that massive brute squad like I tend to use it. Uh, however, I've brought in uh, loner artillery from Fourth Corps and... Uh, Actually, I don't think I brought any loner artillery from First Corps in this battle. Um, so what I'm doing right now on the screen is I'm collecting all of the divisions into this block of trees and basically a uh, a core column, essentially. Um, and I, w I wasn't expecting to get three core as soon as I do, but okay, then I kind of have to figure out what I'm doing. Um, generally speaking, my uh, vision for the battle plan is to fix from the front with uh, detached skirmishers so that I can try and wiggle them around and get a, a line of sight on Confederate artillery and then um, handle or destroy, if possible, um, the inevitable Confederate skirmishers who are going to be out front of this operation uh, and use long-range artillery, of which this battle, this army is almost exclusively con con consisted, um, and batter uh, their batteries um, out of existence. Uh, additionally, with, with any traditional salient, um, you essentially try and pinch it off. So find uh, where the salient kinks outward, um, or where you feel like it's weakest, you pinch in there and then exploit your gap. Uh, this is <clears throat> more or less, uh, you know, World War I um, tactics wrote large. It's exactly what I would do if I was at the Somme or whatever, is try and find uh, a piece of the line that I could pierce, establish that foothead or foothold, 
and then um, expand the breach. And it becomes difficult to do that without armored vehicles uh, in in the in the First World War, um, because cavalry, which has traditionally been the uh, exploiter of breakthroughs, uh, the rate of fire and the accuracy of the infantry weapon at that point in time has gotten to the point that it's even worse than it is in this game. In this game, cavalry is basically, if you use them incorrectly or, or charge from the wrong direction, they just fall apart, uh, and that's even more so the case in the First World War. Uh, so here, fortunately, everybody's using muscle-loading um, muzzle-loading rifled muskets. So yes, they're still rifled. Yes, they're still accurate. Yes, they're still all those things. But it's not a bolt-action, you know, Springfield 1903 or SMLE. Um, Mark III, I think? Whatever. Um, it's not of that. It's not, it's not that stuff. And it's what, it, what that means is the rate of fire is so low that cavalry is mostly okay um, to pierce the breach. So what you're trying to do with Mule Shoe, really, more than anything else, <laughs> is minimize your casualties. Uh, this is the kind of battle where um, you can chew up an entire core. And and uh, I'm not going to pretend that we don't take heavy casualties in this fight. We do. Um, but I think that this it could be a lot worse than it ends up being. Um, it's messy and difficult to penetrate the Confederate position. But once you do, you're mostly in the clear. Um this is also a fight where you for sure want to be screening your force with skirmishers. Uh, and here they're almost, um, they're more scouts than they are really skirmishers. They're intended to get, to, get uh, to, to, I don't know how they do this in the game, you know, like you deploy them forward. They're forward observers, uh, <laughs> for your counter battery work. Um, this is a battle where the counter battery work is, vital vital to get right um managing your artillery is is going to be the difference between uh success in this fight and and failure uh and the early phases are messy because you're still getting everything into position and you got to go a long way the game encourages you to attack via the front because your troops come in that direction and historically that's exactly what did happen um but <laughs> you really don't want to do that man it's too expensive to replace the, the losses you'll take at this point in the campaign and you just it's just not worth it um so yeah um continue pushing your dudes forward your your scouts um i get my artillery online so the third the first second corps artillery complement is predominantly 20 and 10 pound parrots um and i think that's it i think i might have one unit of i'm looking at the screen right now it looks like it's all parrots yeah so 10 and 20 pound parrots uh and man they do gangbusters in this battle they they eviscerate artillery battery confederate artillery before it has a chance to really even get going um it's it's a thing of beauty watching uh massed batteries like this really get to work because uh, the union grand battery in this fight just does stupid stupid work they do they do great um the third core is kind of I don't want to say the drips and the dregs, but it's what I've what I've got access to. So it's one unit of howitzers, uh, predominantly intended for once I once I uh, penetrate the Confederate position, and then it's uh, a smattering of of wires, uh, ten and twenty pound howitzers, or no, uh, sorry, parrot guns, and um, yeah, they're they're used mainly for the same thing um with with a side of uh infantry support that's predominantly why i have the wires uh as they're light enough to keep up um with the advance what's interesting from kind of a, a, a post battle kind of perspective is how eager um confederate brigades and especially their cavalry are to leave the safety of their trench works and come meet me um, and not in like, not in the places you'd expect. Uh, let's, let's look at this from the Confederate position. They've got a pretty great series of trench works. Like those are some awesome trenches. And uh, usually I think trenches are death traps. And in this particular battle, they really aren't. Um, 
And then there's this like block, this little square thing, this diamond of woods uh, jutting out from their position. If 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 they took some of their rear echelon, like second layer of trench supporting troops and put them in that diamond, man, you know, like on the edge of the woods, they're just just trading fire or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Uh, it'd be kind of hard to really do much. Uh, additionally, there's all these woods to the far left of the screen. Union right, which is where I'm going to ultimately make my offensive push. Um, there's all these woods that they could be occupying, and they're not for whatever reason. Um, but if they were, you know, where my guys are kind of crossing that creek right now, where the artillery is, if there was even a token force there, I'd be hard-pressed. I, I would eventually break it, but that would let them know that was coming, and they wouldn't maybe be caught by surprise. Now, the AI is never caught by surprise. The AI, you know, it's it's the AI. Okay, right? It knows where your things are, even if the game programs it to behave like it doesn't. Um, but a true surprise would, would really kind of catch somebody by, they just wouldn't be ready for it. And uh, they have the numbers, I think, to resist me, but they're geographically in such a place such as spread out manner that I, I'm able to sort of defeat their entire army in detail um, so this is really cool that they kind of come out and meet me like this it's kind of silly that they do but this is a pretty decent attack three brigades and they're pretty aggressively charging up the field they've got skirmisher support um, unfortunately for them the skirmisher supports on the flanks if they properly screened the attack with skirmishers Imagine these 6,000 uh, Confederate infantry screaming at me with a proper screen of skirms in front. I don't know what the hell I do, to be quite frank with you. Like, the level of fire I would, I would almost certainly receive would, well, my fire going out would be ineffective at um, stopping them. Mark. Um, Mark. And uh, anyway, so there's some quibbling I could do about the attack. But if they'd properly screen this, I would be probably hard-pressed to stop these guys from, from getting in and amongst my dudes. And that would really screw up my plan. Because I've got um, some, relatively speaking, understrength brigades here kind of trying to hold the line, mostly because they're there to screen the artillery. Um, but when they attack like this, I'm forced to bring my skirmishers back. And uh, when that happens, the most immediate target for the artillery is these infantry brigades. And the intent had always been to use the skirmishers for two reasons. One, they take less damage from shooting anyway, especially if they're in cover. And they have the better, they have superior spotting, so I can use them as a, as forward observers for my artillery batteries. Now we can pretend they've got radios or something, um, <laughs> and they're calling out a fire mission. Name the grid coordinates: uh, Yankee Gulf, four two, one two seven five, eight eight three four. Um, fire for effect, but I mean. I don't know. They're using smoke signals or something. I don't. It doesn't matter. Um, there's some anachronisms, uh, but when the attack comes in that hot and heavy, I'm forced to pull back the skirmishers or risk risk them being you know just consumed. And uh, what does it do? You look at the map. I can't see. I can't see artillery right now, and that blinds me uh, to where their guns are. But they can still see me plenty. Um, <clears throat> there's this other excellent push here up this this spine of woods where that... Uh, when, what's his name? It's not B, but it kind of looks like B. It's, it's four letters, starts with a B. He's got 1,950 some odd men. Brewer, Baker, it's a B word, whatever. That guy. He's pushing up. And he's pushing up in a covered position. So my artillery is pretty ineffective. I've got nothing there to stop him except for uh, 150 some odd skirmishers who, who do not <laughs> fare well on that particular engagement. Um, and, and the elements of, uh, I want to say, 
three cores uh fourth division oh this is second cores division okay second cores fourth division <clears throat> who i utilize to try and counter that you know they, they're still not in position they're still moving up um all that kind of stuff so i, I I collapsed my forces in on a, on a group, and I'm not entirely sure that was the smart thing to do because there's, I still need to cast kind of a wide net just to just to see and or stop all of the various and sundry pushes the Confederates are going to make. Um, but I don't, I didn't realize that going into the battle, so my battle plan needs to adjust, and it, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so Greg comes out here. Uh, we finally got an eye on one of their cannons, and I start blasting the crap out of that. Uh, we're still getting our um, our third core attack force into position. My intention here is to swarm and overwhelm this one unit kind of on the end, this isolated unit. I and mean, the thought process being if I can flank it and everything else, I'm expecting it to behave like every other trench. If you shoot it in the flanks, they take obscene morale damage and fall apart uh, and, and route. And when that doesn't happen, and then they... Um, start shooting at me in a very effective fashion, I kind of freak out. Uh, I don't want to say I panic, but it's... My plan ceases to work, and I, I kind of come up with another one on the fly, which I'm not entirely sure was the right, right call. It was a, a more costly attack than I expected. However, I didn't talk about the finances. Um, <coughs> apologies. Uh, we're at economics 10 I sold off a bunch of crap a bunch of weapons I'm never going to use I sold off all my 12 pound howitzers all my napoleons, all my farmers all my uh, sharp 1855 muskets I sold off yeah so let's take a look at this we're flanking him to crap him back he doesn't seem to be affected at all um, so I, my intention now is to utilize the um, too many units in combat morale debuff and just overwhelm him that way i'm not trying to get kills here i'm trying to break them um because i need them to, to evacuate those trenches so i lead the attack with skirmishers which is probably a mistake because those skirmishers don't make it as you can imagine um i swarm in with two brigades they somehow can still fire off an organized volley which is just frustrating as hell i've got artillery support i've got charging cavalry i've got <coughs> two more brigades coming in behind that now the only saving grace is that that attack is being led by one-star units who I can replace with relative ease. Um, so I'm not mega, mega worried about the casualties here in terms of a financial pers perspective. It's just, this is probably not the most effective way to do this. It's just to, to fucking mob them. Like, that's not really the way that you lead troops effectively. It's just sort of like, throw numbers at them. This is not Soviets. Uh, we're not watching uh, Enemy at the Gates. Anyway, it, it works. It's not clean. It's not pretty. This is not the way that I wanted to do this. I, I generally pride myself on somewhat better play than this, but um, I mean, looking at my kind of my playthrough, it's pretty apparent that I I need to work on my offensive um, maneuver. I'm really good at maneuvering quickly, securing a defensive position, and then holding it, um, and and what I'll call aggressive bunkering. Um, and I mean, like I do that in other games too. Like I'm really good at I'm really good at that strategy of like seize an important piece of terrain and then you like capitalize it. But uh, taking <laughs> taking terrain the enemy already holds is apparently something I'm not great at because I've done I did this the same thing at the what's the hell that one battle's called? It's the one where you, like there's like three artillery batteries and you gotta charge it or something and you know like. Uh, sp sp uh, something compass just blasted them <laughs> like with their artillery out of that hole and I, I just charged it like an idiot what am I doing here same shit charging them like an idiot I mean it works it's effective right and these are these are casualties I can afford to replace from a cost a cost perspective I'm not worried about what this costs um, but in terms of clean play this is most definitely not it not an example of clean play um, again we do this it's fine we, we, we take this sort of cut out here um, and then we, we firm up our foothold. Um, we get Perry out of there pretty quick. We get, uh, looks like keys or bays or maybe rays. Um, 
It's the unit in trenches immediately to the north of the position we just took. It looks like keys. Uh, I can't see. Um, same shit. I'm always trying to take out officers. I'm always trying to take out artillery. Um, you know, and that kind of thing. But these trenches are amazing. These are great trenches. Whatever the Confederate engineers are doing, they're fantastic. These are great trenches. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get amongst 10. I have been generally decommissioning the Harper's Ferry uh, and the 1855 um, Springfield Musket. Uh, generally, I'm trying to... Oh, and the, the Wrens. Uh, I'm trying to decommission the uh, 55 first more than anything else so i'm still using enfields i'm still using um harper's ferries but i have a obviously no more uh, whatever i've got is what i've got um <clears throat> so i'm trying to put them in the hands of fewer and fewer units and typically speaking if you've got two stars um or above um i'm giving you a springfield 61 or a springfield 63 if you've got one star it's really just kind of catch as catch can um, so if you're a one star unit, I'm using whatever I've got. Uh, if you had a 55, I've upgraded you to whichever is the most available of the Enfield, uh, the Harper's Ferry or the 61. The objective is to have as high as possible the utilization oh, or the Richmond. Um, as high as possible utilization of the Springfield 61 as possible in the Army uh, before going to Richmond. So I'm going to spend a significant amount of cash before Cold Harbor um, upgrading units in that instance. Uh, additionally, when it comes to guns, you know that I had a shitload of 24-pounders. I'm now um, transitioning to utilization, a higher percentage utilization of rifled guns as the counter-battery mission has become increasingly important uh, in the Artillery Corps for the Union Army circa 1864 um, than it has in the past. Predominantly, in artillery was predominantly utilized for anti-infantry work and is now it is a um, infantry support by way of strong counter-battery uh, mission. So its needs have evolved, and as a result, the guns that best fit that mission have also evolved. Um... Side bonus of penetrating the Union, the Confederate position here. We're still, we're still in the position or the act of ca uh, consolidating our foothold. I really, really, really need to get keys or bays or rays or hays or this guy right here. The dude, the, the Confederate unit in the trenches, in the cornfields, immediately north of where I've breached. That guy. Can't read his name. Screen's too small. My apologies. But that dude needs to get the F out. He is causing me all kinds of consternation right now. Perry, not so much of an issue. He's in the open. He'll, he'll lose eventually. You'll get the idea. Um, but the situation at the moment is very tenuous for the Union attack. I need to establish and secure my foothold. It's expensive in terms of men to do it, and I am um, nervous about if I can't consolidate this foothold, Hayes. All right. Finally, I zoomed in enough. It's Hayes. If I don't consolidate this foothold and, like, secure it, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, like, breach again. You know? Like, I don't know if I'm going to be... If they get those trenches again, I don't know if I'm going to be able to breach a second time. So I've got artillery blasting the crap out of him. I've got infantry flanking him. Um, I'm trying to, like, convince him to just, you know, give ground, and he's not doing it. Uh, so it's not going great. It's really not going great. These trenches are fan fan fantastic slash phenomenal. And that's what happens when you try and say two words at the same time. Um, so there's a, a little bit of a bug uh, that I think needs worked on for Ultimate General 2 or, you know, whatever, whatever the continuation of this series becomes. Um, once the battlefield position kind of continues to expand. So so I do eventually kind of consolidate this this foothold. It's messy, but it works. Um, I do consolidate this position and begin wrapping up uh, the mule shoe, which was which was always my battlefield plan. My plan was to was to pierce and then wrap it up. Um, and once I've degunned them, I'm willing to engage second core as well. So second core has been doing very little actual fighting in terms of 
infantry on infantry. They've been doing plenty of counter battery work, as you can imagine. Um, but I'm still just pouring more and more troops into the breach with the intention of securing and eventually consolidating that foothold. Um, once I do, there's a number of instances where a Confederate unit enters, finger quotes here, the trenches and is treated as being in those trenches from the second it enters. So they're not in the trench in terms of the animation, in terms of where the sprites are on the screen. They're somewhere else. But in terms of where the game calculates their position to be for the purposes of firing location or firing direction, they are in the trenches. And that is a huge problem because my troops will be physically standing on top of the trenches, but the Union troops can't enter these trenches. Um, I'll be, or, you know, breastworks, whatever they are. I'll be standing, they, they were historically actual trenches. I don't know if this game has the technology to illustrate, like, cut uh, cuts into the earth. So they use the sort of, I don't know, these barrels, sandbags, whatever, to kind of indicate where, where entrenchments would be. And that's fine. It's it's okay. Um, <clears throat> it's an art asset thing. I don't have an issue with it. I, it, it the, the intent is clearly broadcast, so I'm fine with it. Um, you, Confederate units enter the trenches and then are treated as being in the trenches from where they shoot. So... Um, you'll see this later and I'll call it out. It's incredibly frustrating because a unit that is not flanking me is all of a sudden treated as flanking me. And a unit that is not in melee with me and I would be able to scare it off um, with supporting fires and flanking fires and the, and the like is all of a sudden treated as being, being in melee with me when it's not. Um... So, as, you, as you're aware, melee offers a significant um, amount of morale damage, condition damage, and, uh, well, that's it, and, and inflicts casualties. Flanking fire does those things as well. If a unit can magically generate high amounts of flanking damage and condition damage and, you know... Uh, morale damage uh, that that's fine that's a thing that every unit should want to do but the manner in which it occurs when they enter those trenches is uh, dubious it stretches credulity now there's a degree of, of um, suspension of disbelief you know that I would have this level of um, accurate battlefield control. We talked about it earlier. How, how exactly are my skirmishers relaying the position um, of the artillery back to um, the cannon commanders so accurately and so quickly? Uh, a lot of that stuff. Okay, there's some gamest things that occur here. But yeah, so we, we blast them out of those trenches and at this point in time, I now feel safe. I now feel like this battle has shifted in my favor and it is now simply a matter of playing clean, playing smart, and wrapping things up. So, uh, suspension of disbelief, where where that becomes stretched, and we, we saw it in um, Panda Kraut's playthrough of the Battle uh, of Stay Alert, where the cavalry teleports, basically, where it's essentially the sprites are in one location, and the, um, the XY coordinates... Uh, of that cavalry in the game engine don't line up. The, the game thinks the cavalry is somewhere where it's... I mean, I'm sure it is there. I'm gonna, let me rephrase that. The game thinks the cavalry is in one location. The game tells you the cavalry is in a different location. Um, w w for a game that's based so heavily on, you know... Here, this, ha this is exactly where it happens. Um, for a game that's based so heavily on accurate feedback and reconnaissance, you need the information the screen tells you to be, you know, close to accurate. All right, so watch Greg. Greg enters the, enters, enters the trenches. His icon moves to the trenches. Greg himself is nowhere near the trenches. My guys are being flanked. My guys are in melee. Um, my attack here just kind of falls apart because Greg teleports to these trenches. I didn't realize the Confederate Army had space marines. Um, so we need to get Greg out of there. It 
it it's a thing. It happens. It's fine. I'll manage it, but it's just kind of frustrating. Um, and we take really heavy casualties uh, a couple of times because of that nonsense. Um, now, in the case of that one unit getting flanked right now and retreating with 600 some odd men, that's definitely because they're getting shot at by somebody else in trenches. So that's fine. That's my fault for exposing them. They're in. They're okay. So that's. I'm okay with that level of feedback from the game. You used your troops poorly, and the game is going to punish you for doing that. Okay, that's my fault. I own that. Um, where I have issues is when you know troopers just teleport. That's my problem. So we're still pushing our breach in. We're still trying to degun the Confederate army. They clearly still have cannons. Um, one difference between the way that I'm playing it and the way that uh, something companies has played this battle is um, he was very careful not to use his artillery on anything but cannons. Uh, and I'm perfectly fine with them shooting things that are not cannons. Um, I'm aware that in those trench works it's a pretty ineffective use of the guns. Um, in terms of a kills inflicted perspective. However, um... I'm interested to see what effect it has, comma, if any, on the unit morale. Um, <clears throat> not that I'd be able to measure it, I suppose. Uh, but, anywho, I use it for that reason. Hmm. Okay, so, um, I have been intermittently talking about the economic situation and then reminding myself that there's also a battle to commentate on. Um... In the course of decomming all these weapons, I'm selling them. And as a result, the money I'm spending to upgrade to a better tier of weapon or a different tier of weapon isn't really significantly costing me all that much money. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's anything else I can use my reputation on uh, in terms of buying muskets, which is fine. Um, there are plenty of 1861s in the shop. Here we go. Somebody else just teleported and he's not flanking me. He's just... Ugh. He's not flanking me. He's he's in he's not in the trenches even. <clears throat> but okay. Yeah, that's fine. And then he's gonna be in melee. So now I just yeah. Fortunately now the twenty pound twenty four pound howitzers are in position and it becomes a lot more tenuous for them to kinda occupy those trenches. Um But, you know, up until that point it was frustrating. With the with the advent of localized artillery it's a lot less of a problem, um, the trench flanking situation, but it is still annoying. Um, I prepped the army for this battle, and I had $64,000, or $640,000. Um, I upgraded weapons left and right. I bought a bunch of um, Springfield 61s. I bought uh, some... I don't think I bought any 63s. I think I used all the ones I had from rep, and that's it. Uh, I think I bought a couple of 20-pound parrots to bump the numbers of a few batteries up to 14 guns, which is probably also as high as I'm going to go. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Like, here and there, I did a little bit of that. But for the most part, it was just using what I already had. Um, but in selling a whole bunch of Lorenzes and a whole bunch of Springfield 55s and a whole bunch of you know, the other weapons and whatnot. I ended up right around $640,000 again. Um, what that ultimately means is I've got plenty of cash to um, really invest in upgrading uh, the army for Cold Mountain. And what that ultimately means is upgrading the army for Richmond. I'm not terribly worried in terms of an equipment discussion about the army for Cold Mountain. I think Cold Mountain's a pretty easy fight. Um... Or, sorry, Cold Harbor? I think it's Cold Harbor. Uh, Cold Harbor is a pretty easy fight. Um, what I'm worried about is Richmond. Richmond is a slog at BG. I can only imagine it's going to be just insane at Major General. Uh, but, you know, hey, whatever. We'll figure it out. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, for whatever reason, and I still don't really know why, because by this point in time... Something Compass in his videos is pretty reliably getting Lafayettes. 
Um, not like in any great number, but he's getting them. He's getting Richmond's. Not again in any great number, but he's getting them. And I'm just not. Like, sp- spoiler alert, I-, I capture a shitload of Tyler Texas's and um, enough 10 pound parrots to start my own battery, or start another battery of them, which is excellent. I have every intention of doing so. Um, but, you know, like it's just like, where where the hell is the good gear? <laughs> Where's where's the where's the good salvage um because i'm still getting shit like it's i'm not gonna shit on the tyler texas it's good money um and the 10 pound parrot is a gun that i had written off and i now feel like i was uh dismissive needlessly so uh of it when i think that the 10 pound parrot's actually a perfectly good gun all right uh back to the battlefield so I'm expanding my foothold now. Um, there's still some messy forest fighting going on in this little splotch down here. Um, but I'm now in a position where the second core can finally begin to think about supporting the attack on third core. And uh, we're pushing and pushing and pushing, expanding our foothold. I'm aggressively uh, uh, advancing with the artillery and preparing to attack with um, elements of two core as they've been de... They still have some guns, but they're they're down a huge margin from where they were. Um, it's now to the point where it's inefficient not to attack with second core. I just need to get one more unit out of the trenches, and then I can move in. And the entire thing that I'm doing here is just rolling up the flank, rolling up the flank, rolling up the flank. In terms of tactical finesse or whatever, there's not really a lot to be <laughs> to be had here. Um, it's 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 keeping the offensive motion or uh, offensive momentum moving um and then just increasing the utilization of force and bringing more and more and more to bear and giving the confederates fewer and fewer safe places for their troops to operate um and making sure it's just you know they don't have a place where they can rally um trying to kill officers whenever i can trying to uh push them out of the good defensible terrain. So I don't want them to have access to uh, all this forest. I want the forest for myself. Uh, I obviously don't want them to have trenches, but I can't take the trenches. So, okay, I'll just take the terrain the trenches are in. Um, And you see sort of where this battle's going to evolve is they're gonna use this territory in the middle here and try and attack from it. And that's exactly what I want. Um, Those cornfields give the sense of cover and, and can, and concealment, but they don't really not enough, not, not like the woods do. And there's enough angles of fire that they're never really going to have a particularly place, safe place to like shoot or operate or fight from. Um, And so my musketry and artillery and everything else will have the opportunity to fully, envelop and destroy their brigades uh and that's the ultimate objective of this battle after minimizing your casualties this is a fight about force protection but also a fight about removing as much from the table as possible for cold harbor to preserve your troops for the eventual richmond campaign um i accept that there are some heavy losses in this fight. It's inevitable. Um, But uh, I also think that inflicting the kind of casualties that I do, which is to say total, in this fight pays more dividends by a long shot than those that I lost um, in fighting this battle. There's certainly units are going to be expensive to replace, especially some of the two star units that take heavy losses. Um, (coughs) But the effect on the army, it's fairly minimal. We have the manpower and the money to bounce back from the losses here without much difficulty. And it just puts us in in an even better place for cold Harbor, which is a battle that I think the union can win pretty, um, pretty convincingly if they play smart um, so yeah uh, the confederate position has 
more or less fallen apart. Uh, we have complete control of half of the trenches. Um, their offensive salience or sally attempts have not gone anywhere. Uh, we have flanking fire on their fence defenses, I guess you could say. Uh, their defenses, but I'm Tish. Um, <laughs> in the center there. Uh, I do not want to trip the flag. Uh, this is a battle where if you do, you trigger a timer, and there are far too many delicious casualties to be inflicted here um, for tripping that flag to be worthwhile. Uh, so I, I mentioned before that as soon as Second Corps gets meaningfully engaged, things fall apart for the Confederates very quickly, uh, and hopefully you're seeing that. Like, the the pace and tenor of the army has, I think, changed dramatically in terms of how quickly I'm maneuvering, in terms of how effectively I'm putting down fires, in terms of how frequently um, Confederate units are, are routing. There's a pretty consistent level of route now occurring um, in their bleeding edge portions of their line. And even when um, Walford gets into that fence line, he's being shot at from enough different sides that he can't maintain that position for long. I noticed earlier I was struggling to clear units out of trenches, and now Stonewall's brigade is being shot at by enough different sides that um, he's not going to stand up to that for long. That's exactly what I want. That's exactly what this position's all about, this, this overall operational strategy. Um, hit them from enough sides that the units just don't want to take it and then occupy and 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 contest the defensible terrain um <clears throat> and then and then let them bounce off of you uh there there is something to be said we've talked about playstyle a lot in some of the commentary i know i'm more aggressive than some of the other streamers and I know that my men pay for it uh, but there's something to be said in my estimation of the effect that this level of momentum has on the ability of the army to mount organized resistance at the same time I think if I'm being honest with myself there's also something to be said for letting your dudes rest um, in between phases of the fight so you know I'm I'm, I'm I'm aware of that, and I think I also probably could have afforded to bring a second unit of howitzers um, to help clear out some of these trenches a little faster. Uh, but we, I mean, we get good results. Their their army falls apart pretty quick here, and then I just continue extending my line to uh, the Union left, the right of the screen. Um, extend my line, extend my line, find their flank. Like, they're going to be looking for my flank anyway. They're going to be looking for a safe place to rally, and I'm going to just do everything I can to deny them that um, that measure of safety, that measure of peace. Um, I want to make it hard or impossible for them to catch their breath and for them to breathe. I want to make it difficult for the Confederate Army to ever collect its... Um, collect itself after being pushed out of a, a, a fighting position like this um, I want them to keep blinking white as often as possible to make their, their return fire as ineffective as possible um, and uh, I suppose I've demonstrated a willingness at this point to continue pressing my dudes even when they're tired uh, to get that to get that outcome um, they keep funneling themselves into a narrower and narrower frontage uh, hoping that mass will make up for poor positioning or something else, I, I imagine. Um, and we keep on punishing them for it, hitting them from enough sides with artillery and everything else that they can't they can't mount uh, a meaningful uh, offensive. They got plenty of men. There's still plenty of dudes in gray uniforms on this battlefield, and. Uh, you know, and it's just not—it's just not going to make a difference. We've got uh, the good ground, and and slowly but surely, um, near where Anderson's currently located, Anderson's troops are, I think, the last real good defensive stronghold that the Confederates have on this battlefield. 
we're going to utilize massive artillery and then flank fires to push them out of that position, that little thin cop, like strip of woods that they're currently occupying. Once we have that, once the Union has that position, um, we can establish something close to a linear formation, uh, a linear defense facing southward, and they don't have really any ability to penetrate my position anymore. Um, it is messy kicking them out of there, but Union... Union musketry, Union infantry work uh, continues to impress. Uh, they do great, great work grinding down these Confederate units that are huge and experienced and everything else. Again, where they're finding these experienced recruits from, I couldn't tell you. By this point in time in the war, historically, a lot of the really good, you know, experience, like the veterans of Second Bull Run or whatever, had been. Uh, not a lot, but a, a statistically significant number of what made up the manpower of the Confederate army at this juncture in the war was conscripts and, you know, uh, scraping the bottom of the barrel type um, recruitment initiatives. Uh, anywho, um, yeah, Gordon's the last holdout. We kick him out. Um, Huffman's on his last legs. We just continue flanking, continue flanking down the line. Uh, making it expensive for them to hang out in the open, but also not giving them anywhere else to hang out. Artillery for flank fire in the woods or the, the in the cornfields here. And again, being careful not to trip the flag. Frankly, I don't want the flag. The flag's not in, 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 a, in a hard to defend location regardless. I, I suppose watching it now, there's the thought process of what if I took the flag for a second and then retreated off of it and just presumably sent the AI into like a blind rage? <laughs> and they, they'd, they'd swarm it they always do um, and then utilize that fact to pummel the crap out of them with uh, artillery or whatever um, and that kind of thing but anywho yeah so economically the army's doing great we're at a functionally zero cost to de uh, decommission the Springfield 55 which is a which, you know, is a good rifle musket. It's, it's just that we've learned a lot in terms of the procedures and whatnot for making them fire more reliably or something, um, manufacture them better. Uh, the evolutionary half-step of the Harpers Ferry leading to the 61, and then the 63 will probably not be fielding in, like, ultra-large number, unfortunately. Um, but we'll see. 61 will likely become the main battle rifle of the army at this juncture uh, after after this battle's over. Um, <clears throat> here we have another uh, phantom trencher. But we cause enough casualties to shatter the unit altogether before uh, it can occupy the trenches. So that's cool. And I mean, you can see the Union positioning developing now. Um, we're in a position now where they're going to be hard-pressed to... Uh, attack, penetrate my position. We, like, they don't have good cover. We have great cover. Um, there are still some units, obviously, holdouts. Uh, Gordon, the trenches, the last position of trenches that the Confederates occupy. Uh, it's a D word. But we're going to take that Cops of Woods, too. We're going to get um, more units online, and we're going to kick them out. And that's basically all it's going to be. We're getting more and more artillery position etc 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 uh okay so um if you've made it this far i do appreciate it um i will cover some of these topics again towards the end of the video i'd imagine the folks who watch these battles if you do anything like i do you, you kind of click through and, and either watch it at a higher uh playback speed or you click through and kind of see how the battle's evolving so i'll cover some of this stuff again but uh i don't have anything to talk about at the moment um, finals are over and I have a little bit of time be between now and when the next semester kicks up uh, and I'll also be out of town for Christmas and the holidays and the like and that kind of thing so I don't have my full setup um, for recording in a, in a way that can be mobile uh, additionally I, I suppose I could drop the save in a Google Doc or Google, full, Google Google Drive folder, upload it to my laptop and play some and record it or whatever. Uh, but I think I'm just 
I'm just going to take that week and be in Chicago and, um, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever. But I've got a while before I'm going to go on that little road trip for, for the holidays. So um, without school to kind of dr- dr- drag my attention, uh, there's still work and everything else, all that kind of thing. But I'll be able to kind of ramp up the rate at which I'm generating content um, pretty healthily for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so it's my goal to finish out the union campaign um, before uh, the end of calendar year 2018. Um, we've only got four or five battles left uh, and my usual once a week schedule was predominantly because my scholastic uh, workload really didn't allow for a lot more than that. Um, and I, and I, you know, my number one focus has to be school and work. Uh, and this is a really enjoyable hobby and one that I'm very, very, um, excited to be a part of and thankful for, uh, the active support from, uh, Panda Kraut, Something Compass, uh, everybody on Reddit, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm very thankful for all you guys' support, you know, but, but school and work is what pays the bills, right? <laughs> so it lets me buy the microphone and everything else. Um, but when those things clear off, I'm left with, you know, work is work and when work's over, I'm done. Usual health maintenance type things, work out, eat right, cook, all that crap that we do to keep ourselves, you know, healthy. And then, meh. So when I'm in, when I'm out of town, I want to focus on being out of town with my family. I want to focus on them. That's, I think, important too. But I've got a week before I go on that trip, and then I've got um, another week on the other end of New Year's before classes get started where there's no reason that I can't knock out um, I can't knock out the Union campaign before New Year's, and there's no reason I can't get the Confederate campaign through probably Malvern Hill, I think. It's probably as far as I can go in that time frame. I'll commit to getting through Shiloh uh, on the Confederate side, but I think that, that the it would be nice to have a series that's complete. It would be nice to get the Union campaign campaign um, to completion. So I think that's going to be the focus is let's get the union campaign done. And then, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, at what I can do for the Confederate game. Cause I, I'm enjoying that game as well. I do really enjoy this game. Like, as you can tell, <laughs> I'm making videos about it on YouTube. So not only there's there, the, you know, the two hours that I play, this battle as you can see based on the camera mostly in slow motion um but there's also the what closing on an hour now hour i spend recording there's going to be some post editing in terms of making things you know there's like i spend a lot of time (laughs) with this game i really enjoy it um because this era of history is fascinating to me and this this uh strategic slash technical um or tactical era is far and away my favorite. Uh, so it'd be nice to have a series that's finished. It'd be nice uh, to transition to the Confederate campaign and then be able to focus on that for a while. Um, and uh, I had heard some rumors on Twitter from the Game Labs development company um, that. Uh, they're working on Ultimate Admiral. I don't know anything else about it. Um, and I don't know as much by a long stretch about the development of modern navies. So there's a, an image that was floating around on Game Labs' Twitter of what appeared to be like a turn of the century a la 1898, 1900-ish armored cruiser or like a dreadnought or something um and uh the tweet just said ultimate admiral or something along those lines um that's really really interesting very very cool and it's one of the things that 
I've I've kind of like wondered where the hell the game goes after this, right? Like his ultimate ultimate general is like three things. It's it's the uh, it's the battle game is sort of a tech demo, so I don't. That's part. That's core to the, the the. It's core to the series, right? But they can't just make a sequel and be like, all right, you know, Ultimate General Waterloo. Um, let's talk about what we think like the core things that make up this franchise are, and I would say that they are, um, managing and developing and building your army, uh, like we do in this game, and um, and then obviously fighting the battles, and there's. A discussion to be had about maybe like a lot of users are asking for the ability to choose which battles to fight or branching campaigns um, and I would say like those are definitely things you'd like but um, or I would like to see as well but I respect that Game Labs is a fairly small studio they don't have a gigantic budget this is not Creative Assembly we're talking about here this is not Sega uh, or you know EA or something um so that's a good thing too, because there's no microtransactions in this game. There's no always online. You know, it'd be nice to have multiplayer. Definitely, I think multiplayer in this game could be. You took this exact game engine, put the bug fixes that Panda Crowds put in his mod and made them part of the core game, um, and then some other things like fixing ghost cavalry and fixing teleporting trenches and that kind of shit. Um, oh man, like. This could be a hell of a game, especially like I'd love to see this where um, multiple players it's sort of kind of what total total War arena is actually doing where total like, multiple players have to work together where you've got you only get a division. You know, you only get one division. You get to do whatever, whatever you want with your division. So it can be all cav or all skirmishers or it can be two skirmishers and one artillery and one cav or, you know, whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. You only get one division and then like multiple players make up a core and they have to work together. Um, and, and maybe you get one person who's nominated and all that that person does is he's just the core commander and he says, hey, you know, uh, fiasco, take your troops and occupy this position and then Spectrum, you know, you, you move your troops and occupy that position and then work on flanking and something compass, obviously take the artillery and <laughs> blast them to smithereens. Um, you know, like that kind of game, that would be nuts. You take this engine and do that with it. That'd be so cool. But, uh, I think the core parts that make up this game is developing your army over the course of a war. And in terms of fighting the linear style of battle, I don't know if you see the same level of technological advancement in any other single war or single historical period except for the American Civil War. I think it's what makes the American Civil War so fascinating is because in the course of three or four years, you go from fighting Waterloo 2.0 to fighting what ultimately amounts to the beta test for what's going to happen at the Somme. Um, or Ligny, or you know any any you go from trying to refight uh, Jenna Auerstead to ultimately trying to prototype all of the tactics and strategies and everything else you're going to ultimately see being developed and perfected unfortunately in Europe in 1914 in a very short amount of time and it's the first time you see um, mass use of rail to mobilize troops reliably. It's the first time you see um, telegraphs, I think, dictating where troops, you know, like ordering troops quickly. And you, you, I don't think it's the very first time you see observational air balloons because I, I, I think I remember them using them in the Crimean War or hearing reference to like the idea being considered kind of a novelty for reconnaissance in the Crimean, but don't quote me. Um, my point is, short of the wars of German unification, um, which occur nearly concurrently with with this conflict, um, a lot of the heart and soul in terms of the technological advancement of the armies, I don't know if you see it anywhere else as rapidly as you do in this game. Um, which is to say, like, the brown bass musket that was used by a red coat at the beginning of 
the Napoleonic Wars is more or less the same as the brown vest musket used by a British redcoat at Waterloo. Um, I don't, I don't have any. Uh, admittedly, I'm not nearly as well read about uh, the Napoleonic War as I am the American Civil War, but the Charleville musket used by the, you know, French army doesn't change meaningfully to my knowledge in the course of that war either. Um, there are certainly, to be said, n new ideas. Rocket artillery, I think, first utilized in the Napoleonic conflict. Shrapnel, named after a major named Shrapnel. Uh, you know, the experiment of the Baker rifle um, or the utilization of rifled troops as kind of special forces in a, a sort. Um, you know, the evolution of the Dragoon from mounted infantry to heavy cavalry and somehow that transition and, you know, if you've got Dragoons, you've also got Cuirassiers, you've also got Hussars and Lancers. Where do they all fit together? Uh, the evolution of infantry tactics with utilization against cavalry and, and, you know, combined arms and how does that all work? Flying column. Um, Wellington's famous reverse slope defense, which is utilized by Jackson again at... Uh, first bull run there's certainly something to be said for playing ultimate general peninsula war or ultimate general napoleon or something along those lines but what what do you do as far as development of the army i don't know you gain more experience and that's it you learn new tactics and that's what you do do you I don't know. I don't think the muskets meaningfully change in this period. So what other, and, 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 and I don't know if the artillery does either, what other screw do you turn to, like, change the way that troops behave? Because in this game, smoothbore troops behave very differently than those armed with rifled muskets. And hell, even rifled muskets. Within that, there's still degrees of significant difference between a unit armed with 1841 Mississippis versus a unit armed with... I don't know, Richmond 63s. You know, like, there's a massive change. Um, cavalry, the same. You know, Lamats versus uh, sawed-off shotguns. Like, it's just different units, even though they're the same unit type. Um, so, I, as you can see, we're kind of cleaning up here, and the battle's mostly over. Um, so I'll stop rambling about what I think they're going to do for Ultimate General Version 2. I... I, I really enjoy this series and, and game labs as a company has been you know pretty i think uh they were pretty good during development about communicating um and and catching bug fixes but it does appear as if they've moved on and there's no further development being actively done with this game comma however there does appear to be mod or administrator support at the forum level for what panda kraut and uh j and b are doing um so, unofficial patches, basically. Um, anywho, the tweet, Ultimate Admiral. I think that that could be a very interesting game because my understanding is that the turn of the century is when you see the same level of rapid advancement and development of the um, warship on this, the high seas. Now, I, I don't think that in that era you see the same like they could do they could do a 1914 game you know like they could they could definitely do a 1914 game era of the dreadnought naval combat is not i think the thing that gets the most attention about the first world war but there's no doubt in my mind that it occurred um you know i mean the the, the british armada supporting the landing at uh gallipoli for example and a, a bunch of other examples uh but as a discussion. I think that Ultimate Admiral could be a very interesting game and one that would lend itself well to this sort of drag with arrows click style, especially if I could set, say, three or four ships together and, and then have them um, in that line of battle kind of achieve a similar kind of... Uh, all of their port sides, for example, are facing against the enemy and they can maximize the number of gun facings and that kind of thing. You would have, I think, the same tempo of a battle in that game as you do in this game plus you'd have some very interesting things like early torpedo destroyers and that kind of thing um using gunboats to screen using gunboats to conduct reconnaissance 
uh, a lot of the same general concepts of linear warfare would would be utilizable in that uh, field. Plus, just the rapid technological advancement, I would imagine you could do the same with a with a ship of the line kind of a game, where the technological advancement would be less in the number of gun or the kind of gun, and more the number of decks your naval engineering can support, and the number of decks is directly related to the number of guns a ship is capable of carrying maybe or something i don't know you could take a look at logistics in terms of being able to keep a boat at sea longer in terms of feeding it and that kind of thing um there's 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 stuff they can do that i think would scratch the same kind of itch this game is supposed to scratch um that i genuinely worry that like ultimate general american revolution or american war for independence depending on you know where you are in the world i genuinely wonder if if an american war for independence game would would scratch the same itch because I don't I don't think that the kind of muskets significantly change. There's Carlville's and then there's Brown Vests and that's about it. Um, I guess there's Kentucky Long Rifles too, um, or Pennsylvania. Both? Probably both. Whatever. Uh, you get the idea. So anywho, I that's the battle. Um, we take heavy heavy casualties. Uh, thirteen hundred thirteen thousand before um, before medicine. I don't know what that translates to. Um, uh, we get maybe two thousand back or something. No, we get yeah, we get two thousand back. So eleven eleven thousand, um, to their thirty eight and change. It's not great. Um, some units like twenty pound parrots. Look at that, two thousand kills for no losses. That's fantastic. We lose a one star, uh, and I think we also lose a two star somewhere towards the bottom here. Yeah, we lose a two star. We we mint, however, a shitload of two stars. So it's mostly okay. It's mostly a wash as far as I'm concerned. We also mint a bunch of new lieutenant colonels. We also, you know, mint a bunch of new generals. We got a bunch of Tyler Texases. We get a whole bunch of CS Richmonds. It's very exciting. It's a good gun. Um, we get some Napoleons, which I'll sell. And we get 12 uh, 10-pound parrots, which is great. That's a new battery as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, uh, yeah. Mm. We get a bunch more money. We get a bunch more dudes. Like, I'm not worried about the casualties. I'm frustrated that the number is so high, but it is what it is. Um, I'm not going to spend any reputation. 28 um, political points is a little low, and I have the desire to get that number up um, and as high as possible before the campaign's over. Uh, I have it on loose authority from a YouTube comment that... Um, the reputation score actually dictates to a degree which kind of ending you get. So I want to see if I can't try that out. Um, I, I'm not sure where to put the career points at this juncture. Like I think about putting it in politics so I want more money, but like why? Ultimately, I end up sticking it more in logistics because I've run into the issue now where even a full supply cart isn't enough to keep the army shooting the entire battle. Um, and then, yeah, we'll... Uh, Put a new a new two star in command of third division second corps. We'll we've minted a bunch of new two star units. That's excellent. We'll, we'll get we'll get officers. I've got a whole bench full of generals and everything else uh, to upgrade things with. The army's in really great shape. Yes, units are small. Yes, units have gotten beaten up. Yes, I do personally like larger armies. However, um, you know I think the small armies work. Uh, the smaller units work, especially in conjunction with larger, cheaper one-star units. So lo small two-stars and larger um, one-stars, I guess. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah, so I think we knocked their armory down again a bit. We knocked their training down for sure. Their numbers have climbed, interestingly, but they're going to get a minus 15% army size debuff going into Cold Harbor. Um, so that's going to be pretty significant, I think. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll take a look at what I can bring and that'll be it. Uh, I, I am happy to be back and I can't wait to wrap out, uh, Richmond. So, um, until then though, uh, I'll see you guys soon. And this is Fiasco, uh, signing out.